All right. Well, welcome to what will be probably one of our longest presentations. Um, Don D'Angelo, professor of American history for Miracosta College and Grossmont College and for uh, Cathedral Catholic High School. So uh, we're going to start about conversation about the Second World War. And if you'll notice, we're going back to 1933 because we're going to talk about the period prior to American involvement in order to get a better understanding. Uh, it's... Um, if you're reading materials now, whether it's the Tyndall and She book or another uh, online educational resource, uh, you're going to uh, find that there's not going to be a great deal of European and global history explanations to accompany the materials. So if you need background on some of these, uh, you may have to go digging online for other sources. But I will also try to incorporate some outside uh, knowledge and information in terms of what was going on globally at the time. Um, uh, if you watch our uh, author video, uh, which is uh, uh, the Tyndall and She authors, um, we um, are looking at uh, the United States coming into another global conflict in the midst of the worst economic disaster that has struck the United States since its founding. And so um, for the United States, when, the, when war breaks out in Europe in 1939, nothing could be farther from the American imagination than to uh, see us uh, back in Europe or in Asia trying to fight a global conflict. And so uh, there's going to be attempts to get away from that, right? So the, um, in 1922, Benito Mussolini became the leader of Italy and suppressed all political opposition. Germany named Adolf Hitler, who's in the picture here, obviously, Chancellor in 1933, and he began to rearm Germany in defiance of the Versailles Treaty. Uh, and Germany also left the League of Nations. Now, the League of Nations was set up uh, after the Versailles Treaty in 1920, and had been based in Geneva, Switzerland. All the major powers in the world were members of the League except the United States. The U.S. maintained basically a, um, uh, an observer status at the League and enjoyed being able to chime in what, what we thought was important, even though the, most of the rest of the world didn't care. Uh, and so um, for Italy and Germany, these were the two for lack of a better word, new powers in the world. Uh, Italy had only been unified since 1966, Germany since 1971. And uh, Germany, of course, had been a major uh, player in World War I, and some people believe the instigator of the war itself. And uh, both Italy and Germany had um, a great deal of political unrest in the uh, interwar period. And in 1934, um, Hitler began taking back for Germany what the Treaty of Versailles had taken away. The Saar Basin was returned in 1934 and the Rhineland in 1936. France, being the neighbor of the Rhineland, refused to respond. Italy attempted to establish a colony by force in Ethiopia in 1935 and in 1937. And the Italian and German troops saw action in the Spanish Civil War, which took place uh, in 1936-37. Uh, Japanese aggression in China erupted two years before it would in Europe, and the next year saw the union of Austria and Germany. And so what we get is a confluence of events, right? And so um, the uh, Italy and Germany and then later the Japanese government will form what's referred to as the Axis powers. Uh, this steel pact, as it was called, uh, was supposed to uh, be... Uh, a sort of um, warning, I guess, against anybody that might be trying to control uh, German, Italian, and Japanese uh, expansion, and, and, and at least in terms of uh, Italy and, and Japan, a restoration of some kind of uh, uh, sphere of influence within the region, and definitely for the Germans, uh, re uh, reinstitutionalization of the of the German Empire, or what Hitler will call the Third Reich. So, uh, arguing that Germany required Lebensraum or living space, Hitler invaded Poland on September first, 
Uh, now, um, the the background on this, however, is that the Japanese actually implemented the first international, let's call it, incident, which was in 1931 when the Japanese Empire invaded northern China, an area called Manchuria. They took the uh, former emperor of China, Puyi, and they uh, put him up as a, uh, let's call him a puppet emperor, of a new kingdom called Manchukuo. And uh, uh, it, it received condemnation, but nobody actually did anything. The United States, however, did send uh, Henry Stimson to the Stimson Commission uh, to investigate. And the United States declared that it would not recognize any land taken forcibly from China. This is a long-term policy of the United States stretching all the way back to the open door policy of 1899 and 1900. And so, um, uh, so as we had just stated, right, Hitler had taken the Rhineland, uh, Italy, Ethiopia. There's a very dramatic speech, which I believe you can download, of the Emperor Haile, uh, Haile Selassie uh, giving a speech to the League of Nations. Uh, Ethiopia was one of, uh, I think, only two African countries that were considered independent and had an actual representation in the League of Nations. And he goes there to just mock them all for their inability and unwillingness to stand up to the expansionism and the tyranny of these um, major powers. Um, and so war, in terms of global conflict, really starts in 1937 in China, uh, when the Japanese will actually um, cross the Marco Polo Bridge and invade China proper. So two years before Hitler invades uh, Poland, uh, we get, you know, uh, Chinese... Um, repression by the Japanese. In 1938, uh, basically Nazis emerge in the government of Austria and quote-unquote invite Hitler to annex Austria and something that was referred to as the Anschluss. And this was going to create the first sort of, uh, let's call it a greater Germany and uh, would unite all of the German people under one government. But, but Hitler and the Nazis... Uh, believed that there were other lands that belonged to German-speaking peoples. And uh, the requirement for uh, the sort of Lebensraum for what he believed was going to be the master race that he was going to create. But the invasion of um, uh, the Sudetenland is going to trigger a, a bit of an upset. What happens is Hitler claims that... Um, uh, Germans living in the newly created Czechoslovakia, in the area known as the Sudetenland, were a quote-unquote repressed minority being uh, beaten and uh, otherwise abused by the Czech government, which is completely ridiculous. And so uh, Hitler made threats towards the Czechs. Now, What's sort of interesting for historians is to uh, look at the circumstances in 1938 and to realize that at that time, the Czech Republic, which, by the way, has an amazingly good arms manufacturing base, uh, had as big an army as the Germans and had the French and the British uh, stepped in and stood up to Hitler, uh, the generals within the German Army Corps um, may very well have risen up against Hitler. Um, what ifs are obviously hard to prove, but this would have been probably the moment to act. And the um, Germans and the, or excuse me, the uh, British and the French do react, but in the most weak way possible. Uh, they cry foul, they ask for some intervention. Uh, Hitler and Mussolini invite uh, uh, the French and British uh, leaders to Munich in the summer of 1938, which is referred to as the Munich Pact. And we get the now infamous uh, appeasement of Hitler. Uh, the French and the British agree to allow Hitler to keep the Sudetenland in exchange for a guarantee for the remainder of, of the Czech uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity. And Hitler makes a promise to never uh, ask for any other land concessions in Europe which he never does ask, uh, emphasis being on ask, uh, he just is, is going to take. 
And so a couple of things are going to happen in 39. Um, first, uh, obviously, Hitler is just going to ignore the whole thing. Uh, he's going to take uh, the rest of Czechoslovakia. Actually, he'll uh, the Slovak area, which is now the Slovak Republic, will be kept as a sort of a, a, a Nazi puppet uh, regime. And uh, Hitler will start to consolidate power within his army corps. Uh, the SS will start to get more control over military operations and the sort of more traditional Prussian Junker element in the, in the officer corps are going to start to be, um, for lack of a better word, quieted. Uh, and so, uh, however... The larger impact, in my opinion, is the Soviet Union. Um, Stalin was in a rather uh, precarious situation. His um, consolidation of agriculture was a failure. Um, the Soviet people were um, starving, if you will. And in 1938, uh, Stalin had his entire senior army officer corps uh, killed. Uh, he suspected a coup, and rather than try to figure out exactly which officer it was, he just killed them all. This drained him of, uh, of um, veteran officers, and he also uh, got a chance while uh, fighting in Spain to see the uh, German and Italian equipment, and more importantly, the, the rapid uh, movement of German troops, something that will be called Blitzkrieg, and knew that he needed both space and time in order to protect the Soviet Union from a Nazi invasion, which he assumed was going to happen. And so we get this unbelievable uh, decision by Stalin to make good with his arch enemy, Hitler. And in August of 1939, we get the Soviet, uh, the Nazi-Soviet Non-Aggression Treaty, also known as the uh, Molotov-Ribbentrop Agreement. And essentially, uh, Russia agreed not to mobilize in support of the Poles when Germany invaded, and the Germans would leave the eastern third of Poland to the Soviet Union. Uh, Stalin will use that 300 miles later in order to defend uh, Russian, quote-unquote, Russian soil and uh, help to defeat the Russians or the Germans in the long run. So with that agreement, I mean, literally still wet, the, you know, the, the ink was not dry yet. And up September 1st, uh, Germany invaded Poland and then war was declared on Germany by Britain and France. And World War II was officially afoot. Here you can see the Japanese troops actually entering into Beijing uh, at the uh, Marco Polo Bridge, uh, the beginning of what some people would say is the true beginning of the war. So the problem for Americans was the same problem that they had at the beginning of the wor First World War, and that was that the isolationist feelings in the United States grew more profound uh, because what had happened is the Nye Committee in the Senate reported their findings that U.S. involvement in the Great War had come about through the role of bankers and munition makers. Congress passed neutrality acts, which uh, prevented uh, American shipping of key materials to aggressor nations. After Hitler invaded Czechoslovakia, FDR, under, FDR began to understand the magnitude of Hitler's ambitions. So initially... No loans could be made to belligerent nations, no contraband. And what that simply means is, and even if it's a commercial product, if it's something that could be used in warfare, it was barred from export or sale. No American travelers could be on ships of belligerents. Now, some people uh, have asked me in the past, well, how would the United States been able to, uh, you know, police this? And my response is, is essentially that um, obviously they couldn't stop people from going if they were really determined to do so, but it essentially washed the American government's hands of any responsibility for whatever happens.
So this was done specifically to avoid the hysteria that came after the Lusitania sinking and the Sussex when Americans who are aboard foreign ships were killed in unrestricted submarine warfare. This stirred up American sentiment uh, against the, primarily the Germans and pushed us more towards war. And the Nye Commission basically said, look, you know, you know, Americans really don't have the right, if you will, uh, to be protected if they're traveling on foreign ships, particularly during a time of war. And so um, in addition to that, American ships, so simply American ships, were to avoid the so-called hot spots. So these were areas in the ocean where there was known German submarine activity and uh, naval combat. So uh, these areas would be designated by the government and then American shipping again would have to uh, bypass those areas. This created a great deal of confusion, of course, but for the most part, again, this was the United States government trying to avoid situations that would pull the United States into the conflict. So the fall of Czechoslovakia is interesting. There were a lot of Moravians, Bohemians in the United States as, as immigrants. Uh, Czechoslovakia had been created after World War I uh, under the ideals stated by, in the 14 points by Woodrow Wilson. Uh, many Americans were very proud of that situation. And now to see uh, Czechoslovakia collapse uh, through this aggression made a lot of people... Uh, you know, take note. And so uh, with Czechoslovakia's demise, Hitler, or excuse me, FDR was able to convince Congress to modify the neutrality acts and to allow sales of war materials that paid in, uh, that were paid for in cash and shipped by their own vessels. So this became known as cash and carry. So it was still called a quote unquote neutrality act, but you see the crack in the door now as uh, they're basically the United States saying, well, we're, we're not going to be involved. But if you want to come here in your own ship, you want to pay cash for the material and take it back on your own ship and risk your own demise, that's fine with us. And so um, this continues, right, um, throughout this period, right, following the invasion of Poland, the Axis remained quiet until the next spring. Now, even the defeat of Poland was a big deal. Uh, in 1939, there were actually more Polish-speaking people in Chicago than there were in Warsaw. So there was a very, very large Polish-American population, uh, many of whom still had family and friends back in Poland. And these people voted. And for uh, congressmen and senators, primarily in the Midwestern states, uh, uh, you know, Michigan, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, even Pennsylvania and Western New York State, very heavily populated by Polish immigrants. This begins to shift American public opinion. And so when um, uh, Germany's Blitzkrieg was followed by a, a several month period of what uh, uh, reporters jokingly called Sitzkrieg, People thought that maybe Hitler had, had gotten enough, that he'd got what he wanted, which was essentially the former German Empire uh, prior, prior to the Versailles Treaty. And so what happens, though, is that in April of 1940, Germany launched its blitzkrieg against Denmark and Norway, both collapsing very quickly. And by May 21st, they had reached the English Channel, and British forces that were still on the continent were forced to escape at Dunkirk on June 14th. Uh, and excuse me, by June. And on June 14th, France had, had fallen. And, and so of the allies in the Great War, only England remained. And uh, we, we needed uh, Britain to keep in the fight because, um, you know, it didn't look like there was going to be much hope of stopping Hitler. So I had mentioned this in the previous uh, war about how most many Americans, particularly in the East Coast, still had a fondness for England. But the duality of these victims, the French, for instance, our first allies from 1778, 
the, the armies that came and, and saved us when we wanted them the most uh, was a great blow. And it's also important to remember France, even though it still is today, but at, at this time, France was considered the center of Western culture and art. It, it was the fashion capital. It was the music capital. It was where artists went to, to practice their craft. It's where writers went to, you know, get inspired. And so for many Americans, the, the fall of France is quite similar to the fall of Rome. And uh, just the sort of heart sinking um, fear of the demise of Western thought. England's attack was very personal, and it, it draws upon something uh, that's actually it's in a movie called Hyde Park, uh, which is, uh, I don't know how accurate of an account it is, on the actual visit of the King and Queen of England. For the first time in history, the English monarchs traveled to the United States, and this was a rather big deal. Um uh, to give you sort of a background, uh, the um, the British monarch was King George and his wife, Queen Elizabeth. These were the parents of the current Queen Elizabeth. But they weren't supposed to be the king and queen. Uh, king George's brother, Edward, who had uh, taken the throne as Edward VIII, abdicated his uh, position so that he could marry a twice-divorced American, Wallace Simpson, Many people in Britain uh, harbored resentment towards Wallace Simpson as this, um, uh, lack of a better word, soiled American. And uh, a lot of Americans felt resentment towards the British uh, because we felt that the British were uh, being, uh, were snubbing our people, right? You know, if, as if an American's not good enough to be Queen of England or however you want to put it. And so there was a bit of tension there. And the government sent the King and Queen to the United States for the first official state visit of a monarch to the United States. And a lot of people were worried that it wouldn't go over very well. But in reality, it was a sensation. The King and Queen were, were thronged everywhere they went it was a major social event of the year. Um, I believe it was back in 1938, but I'm not positive about that date. But it was right around the time that things started to get a little uh, tense in Europe. And in fact, they had to call their um, trip short and return home uh, by ship. And people in the United States were just heartbroken. Thousands of people showed up at the pier to bid them goodbye. Uh, a newspaperman uh, reported that he could hear FDR saying to them, you kids take good care of yourselves, right? Um, and and so this becomes a sort of big issue when the Blitz, or otherwise known as the Battle of Britain, uh, takes place in 1940-41. Uh, Buckingham Palace is going to be bombed. And the king and queen will be inside. Now, most Americans don't realize just how large Buckingham Palace is. Uh, and to not make light of it, it was bombed twice and it was a significant bombing. I don't mean to belittle it at all. Uh, however, Americans were outraged. This struck a chord for so many Americans because that young couple, they had just two young girls at the time, how dare Hitler do this? And then, of course, uh, Westminster Abbey is bombed and the London Tube is, you know, attacked and people are going on. There was a, a very famous American radio commentator, Edward R. Murrow, who every evening broadcast live from the streets and uh, in a broadcast that was uh, quite unique. Uh, his, his voice, Edward R. Murrow, became the most recognized voice in America next to FDR with his famous opening of This is London. And at one point actually hang, hung his uh, uh, microphone out of his hotel window so that you could hear the bombs uh, falling on London. Americans were outraged. 
Mother England is now under attack. And suddenly, neutrality took new meaning. So what happened? Something called Lend-Lease is going to come forward. Uh, at first, the um, FDR informed the American people that the British had agreed to lease uh, a number of Caribbean ports to the United States in exchange for us lending them uh, 50 old uh, destroyers and battleships for, uh, from World War I, ships that we were quote-unquote not using anyway. Uh, and this was considered a great thing for the United States. We, we got these free ports in the Caribbean. In reality, Britain had reported to the United States that they were going to have to abandon those those ports so that they could use that um, personnel and material to defend England itself. And so it was really based out of crises rather than uh, convenience. And so, um, but the American people bought it. And in part because, in my opinion, their hearts and their, their heads had been turned away from this idea of being neutral and were now becoming increasingly anti-German again. Uh, so Lend-Lease gets supported uh, with this these slogans, uh, billions but not bodies, um, sons but, uh, excuse me, guns but not sons. And, and so everybody jumped on board saying, hey, let's give the Allies support so that we don't have to get involved. And, um, and so this idea of keep Britain alive became a big rallying cry for another quote-unquote uh, neutrality act, Lend-Lease. Uh, and FDR is going to make a famous fireside chat which, uh, in which he gives this analogy of how your neighbor might have a fire break out in his home and if he were to come to you and ask for your garden hose so that he could put out his fire... Um, well, who wouldn't do this, right? He, he says to us, well, you know, he's going to bring the, the hose back when, he's, when the danger is gone. And of course, we want him to put out his fire because we don't want it to spread to our house, right? And of course, this is logical. Of course, this makes sense, right? So the United States, um, uh, let's say grudgingly, but uh, enthusiastically uh, steps into keep it alive. So at this point, Japan's invasion of China had bogged down and it was forced to look elsewhere for natural resources to fuel its war machine. Uh, these items were readily available in the Pacific Islands. Uh, as Japan became more aggressive, FDR would further limit the exporting of American goods. Right. So uh, what happens, eventually we had to cut off Oil, scrap and iron shipments, Japanese leaders realized that in order for the attacks on the Pacific Islands to be successful, the U.S. Pacific Naval Fleet had to be eliminated. Uh, FDR is going to make what's called the quarantine speech. And I should mention here that uh, there was a delicacy that had been uh, created because of the neutrality acts. The neutrality acts would go into effect whenever the president of the United States officially declared that a war existed between any combatants, so any war. So in 1936, when the uh, Spanish Civil War broke out, uh, FDR recognized the Spanish Civil War. Well, that immediately barred uh, the United States and the American people from openly participating on behalf of any of the combatants. And, and many people feel that... Um, uh, the Spanish regime was sacrificed for that purpose. And so um, when Japan invaded China in 1937, the President of the United States never used the word war. This permitted the United States to continue giving support to China. So when FDR made his quarantine speech against the Japanese, and this is in, I believe, 1939, uh, he was cutting off basically all shipments of war material to the Japanese. And this was the sort of big moment, as it were. 
So this uh, issue spoke to this idea of rival empires. And um, earlier in the semester, I, when I, we were talking about American imperialism, I spoke about how the United States had always wanted China and Russia to stay strong to some degree in order to be counterweights to the Japanese emerging imperial designs. And here we see it coming to fruition. Uh, the Japanese resentment goes way above normal when we issued the quarantine speech, which basically uh, singled out Japan as the aggressor in the, in the Pacific and in Asia and denying them the materials that they thought they deserved. And so the Japanese decided that the only thing that could be done was to um, take out the United States. Now, this is where you can have all kinds of fun if you want as a historian. But <clears throat> there tends to be somewhat of a consensus that the Japanese believed that if they went in and just wiped out the Pacific fleet at Pearl Harbor, that the Americans would be so shocked and, and sh so um, demoralized that they would, uh, in a sense, beg the Japanese to take the Hawaiian Islands just to leave them alone. And uh, the, the Japanese had, to some extent, I suppose, uh, overestimated what the word neutral meant. And to many people on the Japanese um, cabinet under Tojo uh, had this belief that somehow, um, you know, the, the United States um, was a pacifist country, that it would do whatever it took to stay out of conflict rather than uh, go forward. So there were diplomatic meetings going on in Washington uh, in order to end Japanese involvement in China. Uh, the Japanese government approved plans to bomb the U.S. Navy at anchor in Pearl Harbor. And on December 7, 1941, Japanese planes bombed eight U.S. battleships, destroying three and damaging the others. In total, 19 ships were sunk or disabled. More than 2,400 people were killed and over 1,700 more were wounded. At the same time the Japanese were bombing Pearl Harbor, other fleets were seizing key American holdings in the eastern Pacific Ocean. And the next day, uh, FDR asked uh, for the United States to declare war on Japan. And then on December 11th, Italy and Germany declared war on the United States as uh, fulfilling their obligations with the Japanese under the Axis Treaty. And so the, um, the USS Shaw here being destroyed uh, by warplanes at, at um, Pearl Harbor. Um, and the Shaw was going to be repaired shortly thereafter. And it's going to go on to earn 11 battle stars in the Pacific Campaign. Uh, the vengeance is going to be rather uh, severe, as we uh, all know for the most part now. It's also important to notice um, there's going to be, almost within weeks, an aerial bombardment of Japan done by a, um, a group of bombers uh, under Captain Doolittle, called, the Doolittle, called Doolittle's Raid. Uh, they were given just enough gasoline to make it and hit their targets and then fly into friendly territory in China to be recovered. Um, and it was, a, it was a very important psychological event, while it may, may have had very limited strategic value. But the bombing of Tokyo, uh, just within weeks of Pearl Harbor, you know, really, in my opinion, should have been assigned to the Japanese that they, they really went about the wrong uh, policy. There was the famous um, admiral within the um, Army Corps or uh, military uh, officers who supposedly gave the warning to his fellow Japanese officers to, quote, not wake the sweet sleeping giant. He had traveled extensively in the United States and said that if the United States was ever angered, they would just not stop until there was major defeat and catastrophe for the Japanese people. So uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor ended any debate over intervention, right? By the time the war ended, 16 million men and women were in military 
Uh, due to FDR's foresight, the economy had already begun to gear up for war production uh, through the Lend-Lease Plan. Uh, the creation of the War Productions Board allowed for a centralized control of the nation's conversion from industrial to war production. So this is something that's really unusual for us today because we have such a huge uh, military industrial establishment or what some people call the MIC, uh, Military Industrial Complex. Um, but uh, at this time, we were still operating under the old system wherein private industries, commercial manufacturers were asked to retool their assembly lines in, in order to build military hardware. Today, there's two separate production facilities, one for defense programs and, and one for commercial. Uh, but America goes into uh, another degree of hyper-nationalism. Uh, it becomes illegal again to speak German. Uh, Italian is, is basically uh, eliminated from uh, a lot of schools and universities. Uh, the anti-enemy nativism is particularly strong, uh, as we will see with the Japanese internment. Uh, but mobilization uh, really had um, started in 1940 with the first peacetime, peacetime draft. Approximately 2 million soldiers will be drafted for a two-year stint which will uh, end in 1942, but most of those men will voluntarily re-up their, uh, their assignments. Uh, and so we get these, um, I'm going to call them iconic uh, terms in American uh, language, 1As and 4Fs. So if you received your draft letter, you reported to the draft board, uh, you were reviewed, you were asked questions, and you were given a physical exam. If you were considered at the top of the physical ability, you know, uh, just the best type of a recruit, you were labeled a 1A. Um, for those who were thought to be unfit to serve, which came in a variety of reasons and didn't necessarily mean that somebody was what we would today call quote-unquote disabled, um, flat feet, for instance, color blindness. There were all sorts of things that could keep somebody from being uh, drafted in, into the actual fighting. But if you were considered not uh, ready or not fit for service, you were a 4F. And this became uh, a sort of a badge of dishonor for a lot of men. However, many of these 4Fs are going to have the time of their lives they're going to be working uh, with you know full-time work and overtime and making a lot of money. There are going to be women everywhere who are lonely and want to go dancing and drinking and and uh, you know just to get their minds off of the war. So a lot of these four uh, Fs are going to have a combination of uh, shame and fame uh, in this time period. And there's a number of. Um, cartoons that you can watch from the period, especially Bugs Bunny cartoons that, you know, whenever he was uh, kind of working too fast or just not, uh, you know, up to snuff, he, you would see these 4F badges on him and stuff like that. So kind of a, a comical reference, if you will. Uh, the economic conversion was a little bit different than we saw in the First World War. Um, many of these operations had already started prior to the outbreak of the war, as I stated earlier. And so um, the United States actually went about uh, financing the war. Uh, almost 50% of it is going to come from war bonds. And um, this is going to be uh, almost like a patriotic duty for people. The largest buyers of these bonds were women by, by a wide margin. Uh, because of the um, economic controls that were placed on the economy. So, for instance, uh, if you remember from World War One, there were a lot of these volunteer efforts to have people, you know, not eat weed on Wednesdays, not eat meat on Tuesdays. That's gone. It's now mandatory. There's going to be rationing of almost everything, and so it didn't matter how much money you had. There were certain things that you just could not buy: uh, cosmetics, nylons. Um, uh, most home buildings stopped. Something like 90-some percent of home construction ended. 
I mean, it was just uh, some, I, and I believe you were allowed four car tires for the entire war. I mean, there was just all kinds of restrictions placed on people. You actually had to buy food using stamps. So you had to provide the n money and a stamp in order to get your allotment for things like meat and cheese and sugar and butter and coffee. And so um, back came the victory gardens from World War I. People plowed under their, their lawns again and started to grow their own vegetables. And it really was a collective effort. However, women were now working in larger numbers than they ever had and found themselves in possession of a great deal of money. And so they were um, uh, now going to find themselves as the main economic uh, factor in their families. And so a good number of these women are simply going to buy bonds, not just to you know, support the war that their men were fighting, but because there really kind of wasn't anywhere else for them to put their money. And uh, this is going to prove to be rather uh, important later on. So... Now, we had noticed in, in the 1920s that America had been moving quite radically to the left in terms of popular culture, and the Depression and now the war is going to see American uh, domestic life move dramatically to the right. Uh, Americans are going to become demonstrably more conservative. And so um, this is going to favor uh, the Republicans and also uh, Southern Democrats and uh, th this becomes an important issue f uh, going forward as far as the politics of the time period. So, um, so although FDR had won by a landslide in 1940 to his third term, which was unprecedented, the 1942 election, the midterm elections, pushed Congress towards the Republicans. So now Congress would abolish most of the New Deal programs that have been implemented during the 1930s. So... Um, Mobilization in the West and the South is, is going to dramatically change these areas. Uh, a lot of training is going to be done in the South, Mobile, Alabama, and Texas, and Florida, also in, out in California. And so these areas are going to um, really have a huge effect. So uh, populations of the newer states to the unions are going to skyrocket during this era. With millions of men enlisting in the military, women found themselves open uh, to all kinds of new roles. Uh, they were going to be tool makers, lumberjacks, blacksmiths. They're going to be doing all kinds of jobs that were just considered not feminine uh, prior to the war. For African American leaders during this time, they decided to fight civil rights and uh, prove their loyalty to the government. Um, this was going to come about through what's referred to as the um, um, something something like a um, half a million African Americans are going to go into uniform, and the NAACP will launch the Double V campaign: victory over racism in the, in Europe, uh, victory over racism in America, and so um, millions of African Americans left the South for jobs in the North again. So another uh, mig northern migration that we have seen, although they were enlisted. Uh, black soldiers were kept in segregated facilities from white counterparts. Uh, separate accommodations were kept for training them as well, um, such as the flight school at the, the Tuskegee, Alabama. The, we get this, the Tuskegee Airmen, which I'll show you a picture in, in just a moment. Um, it did not reach the extent of incidents that occurred, uh, you know, in terms of racial uh, violence. Uh, that happened before World War One, although there was some uh, definite um, uh, conflicts that broke out between white and black soldiers. So, um, in order to meet the wartime demands uh, for their for their crops, Southern farmers began to recruit Hispanic workers from Mexico at harvest time. The growth of Mexican Americans in Los Angeles promoted a week-long riot known as the Zoot Suit Riot, after the popular suits of the time. Uh, what happened here was quite important, uh, especially if you're where I am now, which is in San Diego in Southern California, right, right by the border. Um, 
the Mexican border was very much like the Canadian border uh, prior to uh, the year 2000. It was very much of an open border. There was a fence, there were, there were checkpoints, but there was a lot more fluidity as far as Mexican uh, migration to and from the United States, particularly in agriculture. The United States had a particular problem. Um, most of the men were gone. Women and African Americans had moved into factories in order to um, meet the production demands. But this left uh, service industries and agriculture short on labor. FDR is going to find himself in the odd position of negotiating what are called the Bercero Agreements, where we basically ask the Mexican government to allow Mexican males to come to the United States to uh, pick our crops and to uh, take care of some of our services. In order to do that, we essentially um, we essentially promised the Mexican government that no Mexicans right, would uh, be drafted into the service. And, and so um, uh, only Mexican-Americans, and about 300,000 Mexican-Americans are going to fight in World War, World War II, which is an incredible testament right, to, to their uh, dedication to a country that wasn't always very good to them. For Native Americans or American Indians, they posed an interesting uh, situation. Uh, Native Americans supported the war effort more than any other ethnic group in the United States. Almost a third of eligible Native Americans served in the armed forces. Uh, and it, it should be noted, by the way, that they can't be drafted. And so uh, they're exempt from the draft, I should say. And so these were volunteers. And so uh, due to their distinct Native languages, they were integrated from the start into every military branch to serve as what we called code talkers as no enemy was able to decipher their language, uh, thinking that it was coded language. And, and this confusion allowed the United States to just communicate openly on radio uh, without, um, without fear of interception. Um, and so um, now, the single group that will be openly defiled, demeaned, and demoralized are Japanese Americans. So after the attack on Pearl Harbor, opposition to the war was almost non-existent. And as a result, civil liberty abuses were fewer in number. As opposed to the last war, German Americans and Italian Americans didn't face quite the same stigma that they had previously, although it did become um, wrong, if you will, to, to speak either of those languages. And some, some Italian and German Americans were arrested uh, the same cannot be said for Japanese Americans. Over 100,000 of them were forced from their homes and businesses to relocate into camps. This was done to prevent spies from gaining information and also protect them from anti-Japanese hysteria, which I find a, a pretty lame excuse that ran rampant after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And um, these quote-unquote internment camps um, are a permanent stain on the American um, character. Uh, obviously, it's not to the extent of slavery nor of our treatment of Indian American Indians. Um, and these camps are in no way comparable to what the Nazi camps were during this time period. It's still an unex unexcusable behavior that was started by an executive order from FDR uh, I believe it's 9908, and then um, was backed up by a Supreme Court decision and uh, and will not be in any way addressed satisfactory until Ronald Reagan is the president in the 1980s, in which case all survivors of that um, abuse are given, I think it's like $25,000, which is peanuts compared for what they suffered. So here are the Tuskegee Airmen uh, these men are going to have the distinction of not losing a plane. Uh, they're, they're not going to be bombers. They're going to be protecting the bombers. And so uh, they will become uh, a very highly decorated group of, of men. Um, and I, I'm doing this uh, in 2019, and I believe uh, there might be just one Tuskegee Airman still with us today. Here we have a photograph of the... Uh, uh, um, Native American code talkers, 
and this is the um, at the Battle of uh, uh, Bougainville in uh, 1943. And here is uh, the lineup. To me, this picture of Japanese internment is everything you needed to see. Uh, those soldiers facing these American citizens, I might add, uh, when really they should have been turned around protecting them, is uh, an embarrassment. So, the strategy for the United States was an interesting um, problem. The United States really enters the fighting in January of 42. And at that point, the war had already been going on for three years. And so the United States found itself in a similar situation that we had in the beginning of World War I, which was that our soldiers were simply not prepared for face-to-face -face combat. But the particular problem was a lot more to do with logistics and the moving movement of materials. Uh, Japanese uh, and uh, German uh, naval warfare was a lot more sophisticated than the First World War. So the first combat of Americans was actually a naval battle that lasted for a very long time called the Battle of the Atlantic. And this was essentially done to clear out a, a, a strip of the ocean so that American cargo uh, convoys could move, for the most part, undamaged from the United States to Great Britain. Uh, if you can imagine, the uh, Great Britain just becomes, in a sense, just this major um, aircraft carrier where it just stockpiles weapons and supplies and training facilities for soldiers and airmen. And so uh, the United States and Britain are going to try to coordinate all of their efforts th that they can. Uh, Churchill, by the way, as soon as we declared war, flies to the United States to physically be there with, with FDR in order to coordinate strategy. And the decision is made for the United States and Britain to attack uh, the Germans in the periphery of their empire, which was going to be North Africa. Uh, what will be called the Operation Torch uh, is meant to give the United States specifically, but also Great Britain, uh, open practice in what is referred to as an amphibious assault. Now, amphibious assaults are ones that start in the water through the Navy, and then there's aerial bombardment from what were called the Army Air Corps and the Naval Air Corps. And so you needed air, sea, and marine uh, personnel in order to secure beachheads so that the army can come on with its major equipment and push forward. As you can see in this map, there's going to be at least, uh, I'm sorry, four separate landing sites in North Africa, um, mostly in Morocco and Algeria. And the United States uh, really decided that even though Japan was the main instigator of American damage, that the United States agree with Britain and that we would uh, do what's called the Hitler first strategy. So to do this, the United States had to convince China to accept massive shipments of American uh, money and uh, supplies and exchanged that for uh, Chinese armies, uh, pinning down the Japanese to keep them as occupied as possible until we could get Hitler defeated. He was perceived as the bigger enemy. So um, <clears throat> when um, Churchill and, and FDR had met prior to the war, something called the Atlantic Charter, uh, uh, referred to as the um, Newfoundland meeting, uh, they came up with a list of sort of objectives, what the world should look like after the war. And this will become sort of like the war aims of, of the allied powers. So in, in this effort, the United States and Britain are going to land troops in an area that's referred to as French West Africa. Now, again, our book really doesn't go into this, but if you can look at this map from the book, you'll notice that not all of France was occupied by the Germans.
southern France was permitted to stay quote-unquote independent. It was a puppet regime put under the direction of the former French General Pétain in what is referred to as the Vichy government, and they were permitted to have administrative control over their colonies in West Africa. The, 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 the stick was that the German Gestapo and military personnel were allowed to operate freely within those territories, uh, but the French were basically had some form of uh, um, autonomy. So the belief was that these uh, Vichy French forces would be less um, fierce, if you will, in their fighting because for the most part they weren't on board with the Nazi agenda anyway. And so it, uh, the United States is going to have its first contact with uh, German soldiers here in North Africa in uh, what's referred to as the Battle of, of Kasserine Pass, which is in present-day Tunisia. And so um, this is uh, a huge hit for Americans. But Eisenhower and, and uh, his officers are able to sustain that assault, regroup, do a counteroffensive, and uh, the German uh, Field Marshal uh, Rommel known as the Desert Fox, is going to be forced to decide whether to stay and try to fight for North Africa, which was something the Germans didn't really want anyway, or to evacuate. And he chooses to flee with his armies back to Europe. And um, this leads to what's called the Casablanca Conference. FDR and Churchill meet in Morocco, and they agree in this meeting to uh, something called unconditional surrender. Now, uh, if you remember from World War I, uh, one of our allies, Russia, uh, negotiated a separate peace with the Germans, and this created a huge logistical and casualty nightmare for uh, Britain, France, and the United States. And in a move to prevent that from happening and to keep fighting spirits high, uh, the United States and Great Britain agreed that no one will stop fighting until Hitler is defeated. And this is a major agreement that they then uh, believe they had to get Stalin to uh, sign on to. Uh, they also agreed that rather than go into a northern invasion through France, that they would instead attack uh, the sort of Europe's tender underbelly, to quote Churchill, and attack Italy. Italy was seen as the weakest of the three Axis powers and the belief was that um, we would force the Germans and the Italians to waste all kinds of resources to defend Italy proper, and that um, we, we, could, we could knock them out of the war. Uh, this was followed up by a Cairo conference. Uh, the, um, just, to give you, I'm so, just to give you sort of a dateline here, um, January of 43 was the um, uh, uh, Casablanca conference and in early mo November of 43 we have the Cairo conference. This was FDR Churchill and Chiang Kai-shek, the leader of China. Uh, Chiang was obviously and understandably very stressed. He was bearing an incredible brunt of Japanese hostility and he also was dealing with a communist Chinese army that although was uh, openly committed to defeating the Japanese, were also uh, doing guerrilla attacks against uh, nationalist forces. And so, uh, you know, Chang was um, understandably stressed. So what they did is they uh, embraced an uh, unconditional surrender policy for Japan, and they also committed to Chang more money, more supplies, and more importantly, full deployment into the Pacific Theater once Hitler was defeated. And Chang, uh, satisfied with this, uh, goes back home to continue the fight against Japanese. So in 1943, the United States and Britain will attack Sicily and then Italy proper. Uh, starts off with something called Operation Husky, uh, followed by Operation Baytown. And the United States is basically going to go through a yet another series of amphibious assaults along the Italian peninsula. And 
much of this is done for strategic purposes, but a lot of it is just logistical training, teaching British and American Army, Navy, Air Corps, Marines, how to coordinate these attacks. Um, and so um, now the Tehran conference in, in Iran um, is the first of the big three. This is Churchill, FDR, and Stalin. And this is at the end of November of 1943. Stalin was um, very angry. He had at one point been quoted as saying to one of his secretaries that he was being punished for the sins of Lenin, meaning uh, that the Allies were allowing him to take the brunt of the war because he had uh, Russia had left the World War I early. Um, there is some truth that Churchill wasn't particularly concerned about the fate of communist Russia against the, against the Germans. Uh, but um, the United States and, and Great Britain are bombing Germany quite early. Uh, and it was a constant event. Americans bombed during the day when the missions had greater accuracy but were more dangerous. The British bombed at night when it was safer. This was not thought of as the British failing to pull their own weight, but as a right earned since they had been involved from the start. Um, now, uh, at Tehran, Stalin signs on to the Unconditional Surrender Pledge. He also gives his first verbal agreement that he would enter the war with Japan after the defeat of Hitler. And uh, the Americans agreed uh, to an invasion of uh, the European mainland by the spring of 44. So strategic bombing was putting unbelievable pressure on uh, German industry. Uh, it was up to Allied forces under Eisenhower to defeat the, the Atlantic walls, so to speak, that was there in order to invade France. So um, on December 6th, 1944, which is referred to as D-Day, um, over 5,300 vessels carried 370,000 soldiers across the English Channel. After two weeks, two million troops had landed in France. And on, and on August uh, 25th, uh, Paris was liberated. Uh, so the advances in Europe by Allied forces resulted in a shortage of gasoline. Uh, Eisenhower chose to slow down the advance and wait until supplies could catch up with the demand before he beginning another launch uh, towards Germany. And uh, this results, this this halt, however, was seen by Hitler as a sign that the uh, that the Allies were weakening. And Hitler does this last ditch attempt to um, uh, supposedly strike a deal with the Allies. Uh, he's delusional at this point. He's lost the war, uh, the battle Battle of Stalingrad, which was in in October of 1942 was the farthest extent of the Nazi empire. And ever since 1942, the Germans were in retreat in some way, shape, or form. But Hitler desperately wanted to prevent an invasion of Germany proper. Remembering what had happened to the Kaiser in World War I, when German officers realized that allies were about to invade uh, the German empire. And rather than face that humiliation, uh, forced the Kaiser into abdication. Hitler believed he could get the Allies spooked out of invading Germany and instead negotiate a, a peace treaty. And uh, so Hitler used basically the very last of his supplies of gasoline and men and, and other types of uh, resources to literally blow a hole between the G British and American uh, fighters in uh an area that is uh, today um, Belgium, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands, so-called low countries of, of Europe. And it almost works. It's called the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, this has nothing to do with Jenny Craig, by the way. Uh, this is um, uh, the British launched this uh, lightning attack right in the middle of uh, Allied forces, blowing a hole right between them. And they reach as far as Antwerp, which is the main port in Belgium, and it looks like it's a catastrophe. 
Uh, my, actually, I have an uncle, a great uncle, who was um, taken uh, prisoner at the Battle of the Bulge and escaped his prison camp. He was actually declared uh, missing, presumed dead uh, in the United States until um, my family received a letter from him saying that he was in a uh, allied uh, hospital. Um, and so uh, this slowing of the momentum uh, was initially seen as a great blow to the United States, but literally the German troops ran out of gas and thousands and thousands of uh, German soldiers are going to capitulate and, and um, uh, surrender to American troops. This is a picture of in, in Eisenhower uh, talking to paratroopers before they were uh, going on their uh, D-Day assault. This was the single largest um, military exercise that we know of in modern history. So, um, in 1944, uh, Roosevelt makes the decision to run for his fourth term. His doctors advised him against it. His family told him he shouldn't do it. Some of his political advisors said not to do it. But members of the uh, um, Democratic leadership feared this rising conservative sentiment in the country would sweep away uh, the Democratic hold in the, at the national level. And so... Um, the uh, Republicans are going to nominate a very um, popular um, and I would say moderate Republican Thomas Dewey of New York um, and uh, so FDR is asked to stay on but Southern Democrats the conservative wing of uh, the Democratic Party resisted FDR's uh, move to uh, be reelected, and we get what's called the Compromise of 1944, or the Missouri Compromise of 1944. Uh, FDR will somewhat unceremoniously dump his vice president Henry Wallace, and ask the junior senator from Missouri, Harry Truman, uh, to be his VP, and this was done to appease the Southern Democrats uh, in order to uh, prevent any split. In the party going forward and, and and FDR easily won his party's nomination and then also won the presidency again to an unprecedented unprecedented fourth term so um, things were starting to converge here uh, instead of having these constant stories of defeat which is what we heard from December of 41 until really uh, the um, fall of 42 uh, now almost all the news is good uh, captures, surrenders, retaking of territory, liberation of cities. Uh, the story is almost constantly positive. But, um, uh, you know, it, it was a, the Allies uh, were really pushing the Germans. And after this initial uh, slowing in, in the Battle of the Bulge, uh, the, the capitulations were happening almost on a day-to-day -day basis. So in the midst of this comes the Yalta Conference, which is in January of 1945. The big three, again, FDR, Churchill, and Stalin, uh, met to discuss the shape of the post-war world. In other words, there was no longer a debate of if Hitler would be defeated. It was merely a question of when. And so, um, uh, so they would address the need for a creation of, of a new world security organization, which would become the United Nations to replace the defunct League. And although many people blame Yalta Conference for the recognizing of Soviet domination of Eastern Europe, at the time, Soviet forces already controlled those areas. It's, it's one of those very big debates that go on uh, in, um, uh, in historical circles in terms of you know, who's to blame for what happened to Europe after the fall of Hitler. And so um, a lot of people talk about Yalta's legacy, which of course is 50 years of oppression of millions of millions of people, is really more of a lesson on realism than it is on anything else. Uh, the Soviet Union had defeated the Russians and had clawed back all of Russia's or all of Germany's uh, gains in Eastern Europe through a great deal of blood and loss. 27 million Russians are going to die in World War II, an unthinkable number of people. And 
uh, his troops now occupied virtually all of Eastern Europe. And FDR knew almost instinctively that if the United States were going to, in a sense, do anything about it, he would have to threaten military attack on Russia in order to hope that Stalin would back down. And he still believed that we needed uh, Stalin's help to defeat Japan. And this has a lot to do, by the way, with um, what was going on in the United States, something referred to as the Manhattan Project. So in April of 1945, FDR died of a cerebral hemorrhage in Warm Springs, Georgia. Uh, now, uh, Hitler receives news of this and assumes that the Americans are going to have to sue for peace because as a dictator, he could not imagine a country able to operate without their uh, Fuhrer, if you will. Um, however, uh, most of the nation will, will wake up and f figure out that there's this guy from Missouri named Harry Truman something, and he was now the President of the United States. Uh, the story goes that um, after being inaugurated, uh, Truman went over to the um, uh, new widow, Eleanor Roosevelt, asking if there was anything that he could do for her. And she said, oh no, Harry, it's you that needs help now. What can we do for you? Uh, so, uh, the, um, death of Hitler, however, is the real death knell of the war. Hitler commits suicide with his, uh, bride. Uh, this is his idea of a great honeymoon, I suppose. And, uh, the, um, German government, the Nazi government collapses and, um, the head of the German officer corps will uh, petition for peace and unconditional surrender. Um, and so on May 2nd, Berlin fell. And on May 7th, the German army surrendered. Depending on where you are, either May 8th or May 9th, most people I think it's May 9th, uh, celebrates what's called VE Day, or right, the May 8th for us. I think it's May 9th in Russia. I can't remember how it's done like that, right? This is the celebration in Times Square on what's referred to as VE Day, Victory in Europe. So we shift now to the war in the Pacific. So um, the setback in the Pacific were pretty significant for the Japanese almost immediately. The first is the Battle of Coral Sea. This is in uh, May until June of 1942. The Japanese were threatening to assault Australia, which at the time was a colony slash um, protectorate of, um, uh, of Great Britain. It was essentially the... Um, army depot, the supply depot for all allied efforts in the Pacific theater. Were the Japanese able to get a hold of this area, it would have been absolutely uh, un, untenable. I mean, it would have been a, just a complete and total disaster for the United States. So um, while the first part of 42 was not good for the allies, right? Allied possessions in Guam, Wake Island, Hong Kong, elsewhere, fell to Japan, Indonesia, right? Vietnam, all these areas, whether they were Dutch, British, French, or American colonies, uh, such as the Philippines, uh, all of it fell under Japanese control. So th at the Battle of Coral Sea, American vessels actually took more damage than their enemy, but they were able to repulse the Japanese threat to Australia. Uh, the new major engagement came in the Battle of Midway. Um, and this is considered the turning point of the war in the Pacific where the Japanese lost four aircraft carriers and the American lost only one. Uh, it's a, it's a, a plus a destroyer, I should add. But from this point on, the Japanese Navy will be on the defense for the, uh, for the rest of the war. It's, it's basically the, the end, right? Um, now, the strategy for taking back, right, falls to uh, MacArthur, who had uh, um, evacuated from the Philippines to New Guinea. And this is going to be uh, something referred to as leapfrogging or island hopping. So rather than go in um, 
sort of logical order, one island to the next island to the next island. Um, uh, MacArthur was going to take his Marines and move them in unpredictable uh, directions in, in order to keep the Japanese trying to guess where the next attack was going to be so they would be less uh, capable of moving assets and resources properly. So um, he, he was char uh, MacArthur started with the Battle of, uh, of Bismarck Sea. Eight Japanese troop ships and ten warships were sunk. From this point, Japan chose not to reinforce any island being attacked. This allowed the Allies to attack an island, allow the Japanese forces to stop sending supplies, and then move to the next one. Uh, the first island would be allowed to wither and die, while the Allies, quote-unquote, leaped to another one. So uh, the uh, Navy Admiral Chester Nimitz took the vital island of Saipan in the Marianas chain. Uh, and you get these uh, battles, first at Guadalcanal, which preserved, um, uh, actually, um, it actually protected a shipping lane that was coming from the Western United States to Australia that had up to that point been able to uh, move material and men pretty much without any fear of interference. Had the Japanese finished their airstrip on Guadalcanal, their bat, uh, excuse me, their um, airplanes would have been able to fly into that um, shipping lane and uh, threaten American shipping. So, um, so the Battle of Guadalcanal in in 1943 saves that shipping lane, and then uh, Nimitz is going to go on. Uh, with uh, attacks in the Marianas. This is Tinian, Guam, and Saipan. Uh, so Saipan was close enough to Japan that uh, B-29 bombers would be able to reach it without risking fuel shortages. So the next stop was to take the Philippines. And the army landed uh, in October of 1944. Japan, realizing the importance of the raw materials there to its war effort, launched a three-pronged naval assault on the U.S. forces there at the Battle of Lete Gulf, which was the largest naval engagement in history, the Japanese lost most of their remaining naval forces and began to use kamikaze attacks. These were um, uh, airplane attacks that were basically, well, they weren't basic, they were suicide missions uh, where these men knew they were going to die. So they were to fight and, and bomb ships for as long as they could. If they ran out of munitions or were shot down, they were to steer their planes into the ships to try to kill as many in, as men or to sink as many ships as they possibly could. Um, and so um, uh, the liberation of the Philippines, which happens in 1944, this famous scene of uh, MacArthur uh, you know, wading ashore, uh, Okinawa and Iwo Jima will be two outcropping uh, islands of the Japanese Empire. And what we know uh, here is that the casualty numbers for Americans capturing these very small possessions, the closer we got to Japan proper, the heavier the casualty rates. Uh, tens of thousands of Americans and uh, others are, are dying. And uh, th this is uh, severe. And what happens is the United States is now attacking Japan from all sides. Uh, the Chinese are uh, attacking from land. The Americans are uh, doing what is referred to as 24-hour incendiary bombing. Now, this was something that we had done to Dresden at the end of the war. And this is unthinkable um, damage. These were bombs that had uh, um, incendiary chemicals in the payload. So there would be the initial explosion that would scatter these chemicals all around. And wherever they landed, they would... They would um, start fires. This is going to burn down virtually all of Dresden. Japan is now facing 24-hour incendiary bombing. It's going to be complete decimation. Uh, here's the famous picture of MacArthur uh, theatrically coming ashore on the island of Lete in, in, in the Philippines. This is in October of 1944 where he supposedly says, people of the Philippines, I have returned. Uh, now, These casualty numbers being reported back to Washington were a serious, serious issue. 
as soon as the Hitler was defeated, many Americans were just anxious for the whole war to end. But the Japanese were simply not giving up. American troops were finding themselves not coming home in celebration, but instead being redeployed from Europe to the Pacific. And so, um, when the Marines invaded Iwo Jima, uh, which was really only used as a landing strip for uh, crippled airplanes, right, that needed emergency landing, uh, Americans are going to suffer 20,000 casualties and 7,000 deaths. The horrific loss of life in these battles led the government to look for ways other than manpower to end the war. From the start of the war, Hitler had been working on an atomic bomb. FDR had realized this and instituted the United uh, insisted the United States had to get its uh, bomb first. Uh, many people will talk about this famous letter written to, to the president from. Um, Albert Einstein and Robert Oppenheimer warning him of this uh, danger. By August 1945, the bomb was ready. So for the United States, the casualty numbers there were simply unacceptable. Um, and planners right, were concerned and we're predicting that in order to take Japan in a traditional warfare, conventional, meaning an amphibious assault on the islands of Japan, followed by an army uh, repossession of the capital, would take anywhere from 100,000 to 1 million casualties. That means dead and wounded totally, but still a number that's unthinkable uh, even at that time. And so... Um, this plays into the Yalta controversy. Um, FDR knew these things. And the, the assumption was that without Russia's land assault in Manchuria and then Korea, uh, not enough Japanese troops and material would be diverted away uh, to minimize uh, the casualties of the Americans and hopefully British support uh, going into Japan. So while many people criticize FDR at Yalta, it's very hard to do so when you look at these casualty numbers that everybody knew were happening. And without the success of the bomb, there was really no other choice. However, when the big three met again at Potsdam, and this was a post-war, right, a post-surrender conference in Potsdam, Germany in July of 1945, uh, uh, Stalin was the only remaining member of the Big Three. Churchill had been unceremoniously voted out of power by the British people and replaced by Robert Attlee. And of course, FDR was now deceased and replaced by Harry Truman, who had little to no knowledge of any of the strategic and logistical understandings that had gone on during the war. So Stalin found himself in a very powerful position and it's at Potsdam that um, Truman is informed that the, that the bomb had actually been tested successfully at Los Alamos in New Mexico. And a conversation now has to be had. Truman must make his decision. And there were many options. Uh, most historians, as I understand it, found that there was essentially three. Truman could ignore the technological uh, superiority that he now had with the bomb and continue with the conventional war. This was going to result in heavy casualties, a prolongation of the war. No one knew exactly how long this would take. Uh, the other was to demonstrate the bomb to essentially take a group of Japanese uh, officers and, and diplomatic Corps members, uh, take them off on an aircraft carrier in the mid of, middle of the Pacific Ocean, pick some uninhabited uh, island in the middle there, and detonate a bomb and demonstrate its, I guess, let's say, awesomeness of death and insist on a surrender. 
Uh, some people latched onto this, thought that it was a, a, a big deal. Uh, however, it was quickly pointed out there were only five bombs available to the United States. Uh, if you were to use one, uh, A, it might not work, and then the Japanese will think you're weak, or you could detonate the bomb, and the Japanese would still continue fighting. There was no guarantee that a demonstration would work. The third option, which is what Truman ultimately did, was to um, use the bomb in what you know some people refer to as limited strike, which that you really just can't even use that language in, in the atomic arena. But the bomb was in fact used. And so on August 6th, an atomic weapon was dropped on Hiroshima, obliterating 80,000 lives in an instant. Two days later, the Soviets finally declared war on Japan. Now, what we understand currently is that internally the Japanese government was in complete disarray. Those who continued to support Tojo and his militaristic designs for the Japanese Empire were resisting uh, any talk of surrender. But other members of the government and some people who were within the imperial uh, sphere felt that the sacrifices were getting too great. When the first bomb dropped, it was reported in Tokyo as a massive incendiary bomb. No one knew what was going on. The government scrambled to figure out what was happening. In the meantime, there was internal fighting within the regime. There was gunfire, actually, between uh, different groups. Um, all of a sudden, in the midst of all this, Russia declares war on Japan. This further uh, complicated the Japanese uh, thinking. And uh, so when Russia enters the war, it's now a new dynamic for the Japanese. They're scrambling for this. Uh, you know, Truman issues this ultimatum and feels that he's being uh, ignored by the Japanese. And on August 8th, uh, the second uh, bomb is dropped on the port city of Nagasaki, killing 36,000. And with this, the Japanese surrendered and it permanently changes uh, the world and the notion of man's inhumanity to man. For many people, it was the weapon that ended further bloodshed. I've had the honor in my life to meet multiple veterans of World War II some of whom are in my family. And for those veterans who were on those American ships waiting for the conventional invasion of Japan, it doesn't, doesn't work on them to tell them that this was a horrific bomb. Likewise, in 1987, I actually met China's first ambassador uh, to the United States. And he was in a symposium with a fellow uh, students with, of mine. And one student had asked him uh, what was China's official uh, statement on the bombing of Japan, thinking that the uh, Chinese would somehow uh, condemn the use of a nuclear weapon or an atomic weapon on Asians. I'll never forget the look on the man's face. He, he turns to his uh, interpreter uh, asking for, for clarification because he, he didn't think he understood the question, even though he, under, he spoke English. And he somewhat calmly looked back at the student and said, the Chinese people have no moral issues with the bombing of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki and then went on to tell us about the rape of Nanking. The relevance of hostility and war can never really be explained, I don't think. 
nor can ever really be justified. The only good war, I think, is the one that doesn't get fought. In this conflict, hundreds of thousands, millions of people perish. We're not even sure how many Chinese or Filipinos or Koreans or even Japanese died in this conflict. The war that is perhaps the defining moment for American rise to hegemony as a world power was a bloody one, even if it was a justifiable one. And it will permanently change the way Americans see themselves and their role in the international community.